So Madeline's Madeline. Madeline's Madeline, I Saw Today by Josephine Decker. It was a wonderful exploration of mental illness and creativity meeting and the vesica pieces, which is uh, the Latin term for the part of the Venn diagram where the circles meet. It really means fish bladder in Latin. This mentally ill teenager in her performing art class. And uh, I thought it was fascinating how it showed something that I recently read in uh, this interesting novel called Jonathan Norrell and Mr. Strange, which is a fiction, a fictional account of the Napoleonic Wars in which magic, sort of like in Harry Potter, is sort of an actual part of British life, but it's been missing from England for centuries, but it's something everyone reads about and knows it's part of their history. And it's these two guys, Norrell and Strange, that, that bring it back to England. Mm -hmm. And one of them stumbles upon this idea which is in order to contact and come into communion with fairies, which are part of the, this British landscape of magic and history, that there is the Christian world, which is the fairies, general terminology for humans. And then there's fairy, which is the fairy world that most people can't see. It's like the matrix mm -hmm. and if, and fairies exist and may enter our world and historically magicians sort of have them as apprentices. And this one guy, one of these two magicians bringing English magic back stumbles on the idea that if one could be insane, or be on that razor's edge of sanity. It would facilitate one's communication with the fairy world because the fairies are barely what we would consider sane. And so he develops this concoction, which is essentially sort of like an acid trip, I think. And he finally hits the right note with all his human conjuring, that little drop of it, of insanity. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden this fairy can't believe that the guy can see him. Mm -hmm. Not that I, I think it's uh, polite to call someone insane if they're really just a kid with problems uh, or not as emotionally mature as she might be later on in life. But in, in, the, in the picture, she's She's been committed, according to her mom. And she's mentally ill. And so she's sort of on that razor's edge between her home life and the class or the, the, the theater troupe. Mm -hmm. And when she's in that troupe, she blossoms and blooms. You know, Hemingway said, right, drunk, edit, sober. And she's sort of allowed to be drunk in this, in this sanctity, you know, in my, my acting training at the William Esper studio, we were really instilled with the notion that this is where you work. This is where you are safe if you have the balls and the courage to go out on that ledge and be fearless. And I know that after 9-11, after that sacrosanct space was very instrumental in my healing process. And it was wonderful to see that for a kid who I think a lot of artists may have been at one point, except this kid is brilliant. And the actress 
Helena Howard does a bravura, bravura performance here. And at the same time, it shows she's a kid. Kids need to be disciplined. You know, they should be disciplined. Disciplined isn't a four letter word. And you see how I think is maybe often the case with varying degrees of mental illness that the person's trying and particularly at that age, it's puzzles where all the pieces have been emptied on the floor and you're trying to put it back together, even if you're not at that age. And someone who is not going through that and who cares often doesn't realize how their reaction to something that the, the struggling person is doing, if their reaction had just been a little different, it would have hurt the other person less. And therefore that person struggling wouldn't quite lash out, wouldn't quite have the breakdown. And if you can imagine being a parent and a teenager, it's that way anyway, that's normal anyway. It's the climax uh, sort of sold itself short. It sort of, had, you know, it sort of flirts the whole picture with reality and not reality, what happens within the, the sanctity of the actor space and real life and it shows Madeline's, it shows both sides of her life sort of bleeding in together at times. And the climax, it, essentially, they lock their instructor out of the rehearsal space. Mm -hmm. And by the time they let her in, in a matter of moments, Madeline has arranged a whole performance that is sort of like the, the instructor's wake-up call. I suppose it could sort of be sort of a nod to Fellini. It was done in more of a photorealistic way than much of the picture was. The cinematographer, I think Ashley Connor, did this amazing job of sort of morphing foreground and background in the corners of the frame with the, the pinpoint mm. tip of the center, maybe the actor's eyes or nose, sort of morphing them and bleeding them in, in a way that was sort of, I assume, reflective of Madeline's psychology. And this climax, I think, would have been better served if it pushed even more for the surreal. Mm. It was shot much more photorealistically than half the movie. And if anything, this should have been the moment when Madeline's experience and intentions bleed uh, internally outward. I'm supposed to buy the fact that in the moments that the instructor's been locked out, they put together this entire performance on two or three different levels in a house to sort of wake up the instructor and then that carries over outside where now passers-by who weren't even characters in the movie sort of participate in this um, impromptu performance. Okay. Which is a lovely idea. I just think they should have pushed it more to more surreal. I, the, the picture reminded me also a little bit of Eliza Hittman, who is this wonderful director, I think from Brooklyn, who had Beach Rats. It was called Love something. Some, some, her, the picture she did in 2013 was this wonderful picture of, a, of another young lady's awakening into, it, I guess, adulthood or, or sex. I think that uh, with Eliza Hittman, there was a little bit, not to say that it was classical, classically shot, but Madeline's Madeline was shot in a way 
uh, again, Fellini, not quite eight and a half, but sort of uh, not, I don't want to say disjointed, but the diegetic sounds bled into each other from shot okay. to shot. Um, dreamlike sequences or? Some, yeah. yeah. But not even dreamlike, you know, where it may carry over yeah. from. <clears throat> say rehearsal she has this pig head mm. and it's, she's going out into the street mm -hmm. and I don't know perhaps the question is is this because she's a looney tune who has lied to her mother about taking her medication or is it because she's just a creative person and who cares screw it or if she's just any number of oddities you see walking by in New York and as long as it doesn't concern you, you really don't even turn your head, which is all fine for my taste, which doesn't necessarily have to be the way it goes, obviously. Um, I could have used a little bit more of an anchor, something to anchor, something to anchor her so that when she's in that space, that creative space, she can get all Michelle Gondry mm -hmm. or something. Yeah. But it was quite a fascinating motion picture. And then we saw eighth grade. <laughs> that was great. Funny how it reminded me of me in eighth grade. I know if if I had been invited to the mall, I would have had the exact same reaction as that young lady. Like I won the lottery. <laughs>